Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. I'm really excited to have Shannon Pohl, one of the directors over at Your Part-Time Controller, joining us. Hey, welcome, Shannon. Hello, thank you so much for having me. Well, we're excited to talk to you because when we bandy about the word best practices, huh, we all want to be doing best practices. I don't care if we're selling ice cream or we're attending to, you know, the, the sick, we want to be doing best practices, but we don't always talk about it in the financial, you know, sector. And so this is going to be a really interesting conversation. I'm really glad you're here to, to share your ideas with us. Amazing. Yeah. It's, it's a hot topic at all times and I'm, I'm ready to hit the points. Good. Well, we've got a lot to learn from you, so let's get at it and see what's cooking today. Again, this is part of Nonprofit Power Week. We don't do this very often, only a couple times a year. We take an entire week. We break it down. Um, we, we're, we get really deep on different s- subjects, but that they all are kind of part of a family. And so our sponsors help us with that. And they include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time control, uh, controller, <laughs> control, yeah, uh, your part-time controller, um, where Shannon Pohl joins us from. I'm Julia C. Patrick. I am the CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, and our co-hosts are amazing. They come to us from all over the country. They're incredibly diverse in terms of the areas that they serve um, our, our sector, and uh, I hope you have been able to meet them as we've been rolling them out over the last couple of months. Okay, Ms. Shannon Pohl, Director, your part-time controller. Where are you coming to us from today? So this morning, I am where I live here in Durham, North Carolina on the East Coast. Awesome. Okay. And talk to me about being a director with YPTC. What does that mean and what do you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I am a director for our North Carolina market. We started it in January. We saw the need based on where our staff was located and where our nonprofit clients are located. And I oversee our market here in North Carolina. Amazing. Um, you know, one of the things that I'm fascinated by, and and um, I'm sure you see this, is that how regional and how different our nonprofit sector is throughout this country. I mean, you, you, we have different problems. We have different issues. We have different missions that reflect that. Um, and so I would imagine being where you are in that part of the country, you're probably, your practice is probably pretty different, let's say, than, than your folks in Indiana or the Southwest where I come from. It truly is. There is such a difference in regions, especially here in the South and especially the Southeast. So this was part of the plan and my passion to be able to touch and work with the nonprofits in our community to serve their specific needs. Yeah, that's cool. You know, I appreciate you saying that because um, we don't always talk about that. We always kind of make it seem like we're all one big happy family. And I think we are. 1.8 1.8 million of us nonprofits registered in America, but we do have our nuances, right? And and so Absolutely. it's kind of yeah. yeah, even state funding, you know, it varies. So it's good yeah. to good to have people boots on the ground. Yeah, I think so. Absolutely. Well, let's dig into you know this concept of best practices. And first and foremost, when you talk about a best practice. If you can like back up just a little bit and tell us how we get there, like how do we identify this? And then how do we start with a strong finance team and even department? So if you can tee that up for us, I think it might help us understand what we're going for. Absolutely. When we talk about best practices, we're talking about making sure that you have stewardship over your nonprofit. There's so much extra care in nonprofits that we need to take. So making sure you're following best practices all around is key to make sure that you're being a good steward of that money. Mm -hmm. When we talk about the finance department, and it's not always the first thought when you think best practices for a nonprofit. We know that when nonprofits are started, it's based on mission. No one's thinking about what the balance sheet's going to look like. But 
it is necessary and that's why we bring it up as a best practice. So here at YPDC, we know the very first step when you're talking about building a finance team is finding the right people. Um, not only are they going to have the right education and background, but they're also going to ideally align with your mission, have a heart for what you do, and keep that in, in everything that they do as well. You know, it's fascinating to me that you would bring up um, and I'm not bashing the accounting firm, but you're kind of bringing up um, an emotional intelligence issue. And we don't always often associate that with our finance teams. I think a lot of times we think, oh, we just need to put, you know, somebody with the right credentials in the desk at, at the desk and they'll crank it out. But you mentioned something that is very interesting to me. You use the word having, you know, a, a, the phrase having a heart for the mission and, and really aligning with that emotionally. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think, you know, a lot of times, even when I speak with my clients, I like to keep the mission at forefront because you're going to get a finance team that understands your people, understands your stakeholders, understands the why behind the figures. And that is really all part of it. Okay. I got a witness to you. I, I mean, we've done nearly 1200 episodes we've done this the nonprofit show for five years now i don't know if i've really had somebody come on the show and talk about this um this aspect of it when it comes to all things finance so i really appreciate you pointing that out i think that's always healthy and no matter i mean if we were talking about running you know a widget factory i think it's the same thing you got to have a passion for widgets right but Absolutely. I like that you called that out. I think that's a really interesting thing. Um, I know that's so why I came to YPTC is to be able to help, you know, have that fulfillment and the why behind it. But that's how you get a, a dedicated team that is on the same page as everyone in the organization. They're bringing their accounting skills. And of course, you always want to vet for that. And there's certain things for that. But they're also bringing, like you said, that emotional intelligence so that they can mm -hmm. communicate what they're seeing in the numbers to your board members, to your stakeholders, to your program team even. So, you know, I'm like, you've rocked my world because I'm just like stunned about this because we don't do this with our folks. And I'm thinking going back to the very basic concept of, you know, mission moment, you know, how we start our meetings internally, externally, of course, you know, our board meetings with those mission moments. And, um, I think that's something that's probably missing from most finance teams, starting those meetings with that. What do you think? Agreed. Absolutely. I think um, it can be sometimes a very serious profession, but yeah. as accountants, we still are sociable. We like to, we like to keep our mind on, on what we're doing. And we yeah. always say here that, you know, we're improving the lives of our executive directors and our clients so that they can improve the lives of others. And that's really the big picture for us. Wow. I love that. I, I, I think I appreciate you saying that because that's really important. You know, one of the things that I've learned from your leaders over the years, and, and I'm going to go all the way back to your founder, Eric Freint, who said, who has, I've heard him use that phrase, um, tone at the top. And in this whole mindset, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, I see it as a mindset and then a communication thing. But we're really in, in terms of seeing our ch the changes in our sector, looking at so many more nuanced things, the digital aspect of our work and all the tools that we're using. So you're advising us to promote a secure control environment and so when I see this, I think tone at the top and, and all those things. Can you help paint that picture for us? Absolutely. That's such a great point. And you really hit it on the head and why you hear it so much is you certainly want to have a secure environment. You want to document your controls. But we've all seen a situation where you could have a 50 page manual, but no one's following it. So you want to make sure that your tone and your processes are set in place that you've really ingrained into your culture, those processes and those policies to make sure everybody's moving forward within them. And it really comes down to ethics and just making sure that you're following those 
best practices, those controls. We're not taking shortcuts. We know mm -hmm. that it can be tempting sometimes, but if you've ingrained in your culture to do things the way that they've been set out for the better of everyone and the information security, that's really key. Wow. I loved you brought up the manual that sits in a bookshelf or on your drawer. <laughs> um, let me ask you, this is a little bit more of a nuanced question, but when we do have internal controls, um, is it one of those things where we're like, well, we have to do it that way because the finance department said it said so, or do we try and educate people as to why we're doing these things? And I realize that might be a, a little bit of a nuanced thing, but I'm just thinking about how sometimes we, we do things without really knowing the why we, we, we act upon procedures or whatever. And then, you know, people kind of have a bad attitude about it. Like it's drudgery versus no, this is intelligent. Absolutely. And I think that ties in so well to what we just talked about with making sure your finance department has that emotional intelligence and the communication mm -hmm. skills. But that is, it, it, I don't think it's nuanced at all. I think it applies in almost every situation is it's key to have the culture, but also have an understanding and transparency is this is why we're doing this. Okay. We're not doing this because it says so in the manual and period. Um, and I sometimes think that that can be very easily um, documented as well. I, I'm a huge fan of before you write out a process or a procedure, the very top is purpose. Why are we doing this? And that kind of frames everything around it. I love that. And I appreciate you saying that because I don't see that enough when we're talking about things like this. Let's move on to this is one of the, my favorite topics, educating the board on fiduciary responsibility. First of all, I think this is one of the big mysteries. Most board members don't understand this. Yes, absolutely. It is a very good commitment when you volunteer to go onto a board. Um, you know, formally they say those three fundamental areas of legal and fiduciary responsibility or duty of care, a loyalty and obedience. And really what that means is they're sticking to the bylaws that are put in place. They're making sure they're acting in the organization's best interest. And then, of course, they have that oversight of the organization. Yeah. When we do this, is this the sort of thing that we do before we bring somebody on or do we bring it up every year? Like, how disconnected are our boards to this concept? I've certainly seen a varying levels for sure. Um, I think it is important with your boards during the selection process to not only follow your bylaws and make sure that the person who's coming on board is aware of that and they're, they're right for this position, but also it is coming back to that documentation, right? Maybe okay. once a year we do a refresher and maybe okay. we built in quarterly some education classes to keep the board engaged. I love that. I love that as a best practice of, of reminding everybody um, that this is, you know, part of it. Um, I think that's really smart. It's not a one and done concept for a lot of people too, um, which makes it even more important to be, I don't know, waving that flag to put it, you know, simply just to keep them going. So Shannon, you bring up some really interesting points about our boards and the fiduciary responsibility. Um, can you explain to us a little bit more in depth of what that means? And then I'm going to ask you a follow-up question about what that means internally to our staff. So what does fiduciary mean in terms of the legal things? And I'm just going to be really blunt. Can our boards go to jail if something happens? <laughs> Well, I don't know if I can speak to that and the legal consequences. I do know that they, I and to emphasize that they have that responsibility of oversight. Um, you know, we talked about emphasizing the fact that they can be held responsible responsible for things that are unlawful while they're in office. Um, that means perhaps they knew that the team did not remit federal withholding taxes and mm -hmm. did nothing about it. That is considered something that they would be held responsible and liable for with the IRS. Okay. So it's really, dare I say, it's a lot. I mean, it's not just what the usual suspects are. It's, it's the um, compliance issues 
that an organization needs to follow on a state, you know, a local, federal level. I mean, it's it's a lot of moving parts here. Absolutely. Absolutely. Nonprofit organizations are exempt from tax, but that comes with a whole host of responsibilities internally and on the board to make sure that the money and the operations of the organization are being held in, in good stewardship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, it's really interesting because the way you just phrased it was, is, was beautiful because um, just because you're tax exempt, it doesn't mean you're legally exempt, right? <laughs> you, you still have compliance. You still have things you have to do. Um Tax, the tax piece is just one part of it, right? Yeah, absolutely. You may not have income tax on your your mission, but there's just a whole host of rules that go around with being that organization. I mean, a 501c3 is a public charity, emphasis on the public, right? Right. Now, let me, and I warned you I was going to do this to you, but let's also look at our our organizations Because I think, and this is my opinion, and I'd love to hear what you think. I think that our own teams don't understand this. And I'm not, I'm not saying, you know, the, the case for the finance department, they, they get this, but in terms of, you know, your development team or programming or all these other things, volunteer services, I don't think they understand this. Do you? Not, not completely. I don't. And, and To be fair, you know, the finance team and the board should carry that burden. But I do think that there's things we can communicate as far as back to the why. Why are we doing this? Well, because there's ramifications if we don't. Um, Even in, you know, public dollars and awards, your program team, who's the one really doing the work for those awards, needs to understand what they can and cannot do with with those federal dollars. Right. So as a best practice, um, you know, we, we started off this conversation today with inwardly looking or focusing on our finance department, but I'm quickly learning from you that maybe we need to kind of share that love. And we talked about the emotional, you know, aspect of, you know, emotional intelligence. Um, I don't see a lot of finance departments communicating back out internally with other departments to say, this is like a day in our life, right? This is what we do. Absolutely. One of the biggest pain points I see when I step into an organization is that the the accounting and the finance team can be disconnected from that development team. And there's so much overlap as far as grant budgets and, you know, what it costs to run a program that having those two communicate and in tune is just an low-hanging fruit and an easy step to to make sure that best practices are being followed. Yeah, I love that you said that because I feel like, you know, when we have our, our departments physically together, um, you can see, and I'll be, I'll call it out, a lot of times they have like the worst office space on the whole campus that they're like put in the back, you know, don't come near us, their lights are kind of dim, you know, it's like, they don't, they're not in the thick of things like where development's always up front and developments, you know, um, because they're the sales team, right? The cause selling, but that finance department seems to get the short end of the stick. And, and, um, and I don't know, we talked about this just, you know, a few minutes ago, the tone at the top that, that communicates a lot to an organization, doesn't it? It absolutely does. And as someone who has worked in the operations of a bank and been described in a workplace as you go in the basement, I totally understand what you're saying. Uh, (laughs) Absolutely. And that tone at the top is really what you need from your finance department is some leadership. Um, You need them keyed into your leadership, but some leadership themselves to make sure that they can properly communicate and guide and educate the rest of the organization on what best practices look like for them. Mm-hmm. You know, you bring up something really interesting in, in that I, I recently, and this is not the only time it's happened, but recently I had a, a C-suite leader who confessed to me that they were afraid to ask um, the folks in finance questions. And and um, and it was, it was interesting because it was a male. And, and so I appreciated his vulnerability because he said, I don't want to appear to be dumb. And I feel like I should know this, but I don't. 
And so then I ask questions and I try to ask questions that will make me not look dumb or disconnected and then help me get through. And I was really taken by that and wondering, you know, as a best practice, how do we get our teams to understand what it is that we need to be looking for and what we're doing in, in terms of accounting and finance, which can be a heavy lift. Yes. And it's, it's such a good point because it's, I'm sure it was disappointing for you to hear that can be so damaging when you have a finance team that feels untouchable, um, that feels like, and you don't, they don't feel like they are educating and you don't feel like you can go to them because it's really key. Again, we're, we're in this position where we have these accounting skills, but we want of the biggest part of our job is to be able to communicate that to the stakeholders and in a way they can understand in a way with dignity and re respect we want to make sure that everyone's keyed in mm -hmm. yeah it's really interesting you know um one of your team members yesterday talked uh, about uh, data visualization and we're going to spend more time on that but you know he he made something he said something riveting he said you know pick three main items or concepts that you want to teach or communicate and really drill down on those as opposed to, you know, 18 different things that you think are important um, because you're going to lose, you're going to lose so much energy, right? You're going to get people that could become confused. And, um, and it just seems to me as a best practice, we need to be thinking about our own teams being educated internally. And I don't think we do that in, across the sector. Absolutely. And that data visualization is such a powerful tool for people who don't want to start a balance sheet and income statement or a statement of functional expense. They We understand that that's not everyone's language. And so meeting people where they're at, if they're visual, that helps them understand what you're trying to say, then that is so key. And if you have 20 of them, obviously you're not hammering the home point that you want to. So prioritizing what's important to your leaders and your stakeholders is key. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really interesting. Well, let's get on to the next best practice, which I think um, is, is one of those things that's like a central core idea. But then I don't know if we all understand what it actually means, right? So you say conduct a financial statement audit. What does that mean and what does it look like? Yeah, absolutely. And I know this is not one that everyone is, if they're not thinking about their finance department, they're certainly not just so excited for their first audit. Um, and so a lot of times we see, especially in the sector, people will not get one if it's not required by federal funding or certain sizes. But really what that audit is, is someone independent coming in and giving your financials value and credibility coming behind those financials verifying them and really increasing the confidence in those so that you can say i've had these audited independently so i'm confident that this is correct and what that does is build confidence not only internally but with your board members and your your funders and your community okay so then let's come back to as, as a follow-up as what we were just talking about um, what about presenting this information internally to our staff and our employees? I mean, I've never seen that done. I mean, I don't know, maybe you have, but I've never seen that done. Yeah. So the finance department is always involved. And then kind of the level that I see of interaction is then to say, we need to do X this way because mm -hmm. of the audit. And I think you have a, a good point. Getting those stakeholders, those program development people involved in understanding the results of the audit and what it means mm -hmm. other than just being a, because the auditor said so, back to our, our manual saying so, but understanding that this is important to make sure that we have accurate information that we're, we're presenting outward. Mm -hmm. You know, it seems to me that if we did this internally and we, we took time to educate and explain, we could end up doing a couple things. We could end up building more confidence within the, the strength of our organization or illuminating the need for supporting development. Like, you know, we yeah, only have absolutely. the more you empower people across the organization, the more efficient, educated, as well as, you know, cohesive your organization yeah. is going to be. 
Yeah, cohesive. I like that word. Um, and again, I think too, you know, you to your point about <laughs> working from the basement, <laughs> you know, uh, this could be one of those things that humanizes or brings the finance department more in line with the overall health of the organization. You know, we all know if well, we don't have a good volunteer management system or coordinator, if we're not working with our donors, if we're not, you know, managing our grants appropriately and all that, it, it, it harms our organization. But if we can get um, everybody kind of rowing in the same direction, it seems a lot more positive and a lot healthier. Um, you know, before we let you go and we don't have that much more time, we talk about best practices. Where do we find these beacons of light or knowledge, right? I mean, I've got to believe a best practice today is not, didn't exist 15 years ago. Some cases, yes, but I mean, think about all the digital things we've been talking about and it's new and it's, it's changing. How should we as an organization look for this information? Absolutely. So you, regulations, laws, okay. best practices and generals are always changing. So um, certainly YPTC has a great resource section on their website that it, we're always trying to keep up to date and make sure that we're providing free resources to inform our organizations. I also recommend um, just if you want to be keyed into the state, your state associations for nonprofits are a huge resource for finance and everything else. Okay, that's a great lead um, because I, I think that that's one of the things I've learned from you today is that this is an ever moving thing. And then also I've got to believe, Shannon, that if you, for example, achieve one of those best practices, um, okay, pick up onto something else, right? It's not a one and done, correct? Never. It's always an ongoing thing that you have to monitor and keep up to date on. Unfortunately, it's not a, we did it. Again, you made the manual, but if, if it sits somewhere it's it, and it doesn't ever get updated or used, then you it's not going to be any use to anyone. So we always want to make sure that we're keeping up to date on current events, laws, regulations, and updating our practices. Yeah. Well, I'm shaking my head because obviously I've lived that life where I've like invested a lot of time and money and energy and creating those manuals or creating those, those policies. And then they just kind of blah. Um, they just kind of sit there. So I appreciate you circling back around on that um, because this is really one of those important things. And um, I appreciate you kind of leading us down a discussion road that is is um, broader than just the finance team. I think that's been one of the things I've learned from you today is that this isn't just about that very select group of people doing a very specific job. It really does leach into the other parts of our organizations. And we forget that. Absolutely. And I appreciate you letting me talk about it. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun. You know, um, Shannon Pohl has been with us this week as part of Nonprofit Power Week. I mentioned this at the top of the show. We only do this a handful of times a year. It's a very specific um, structure to the nonprofit show where we take a topic and then each day we follow something uh, along those lines. So it's very specific. And we've had some fascinating conversations that are standalones. And yet I can see as the week's gone through, they kind of all weave together. We started off with stop stressing about your audit and prepping for it. That was really, really interesting. Using tech as a financial tool, again, today with Shannon, but financial best practices. But I would say in so many ways, it's like nonprofit best practices. It's not just the finance team, Shannon. So I think you've helped, you know, with that, that uh, arc of thought today and then budgeting. So I'm going to call it out. Don't roll your eyes. I probably rolled my eyes when I said budgeting, but we need to be thinking about this in a different way, using a different mindset and then ask and answer. That's like our follow up. Um, not our end end point to the week where uh, we pull in the different questions that have been asked. And so they're extremely varied. And then we get one of our YPTC experts um, to, to answer that. And so a lot of fun. It's been a great week. And uh, if you've missed anything, make sure that you come back and, and watch these episodes. Shannon Pohl, Director of Your Part-Time Controller, 
I've learned a lot from you today, my friend. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a lovely discussion and I appreciate you hosting me. Yeah, it's been great. And, um, you know, it's one of the things I've, I always learn from our friends at YPTC is that um, this can be approachable. There's so much fear in finance and accounting and uh, there's a lack of confidence. There's secrecy. <laughs> there's, you know, people get wigged out when they talk about money anyway. Right. So you you all bring it down um, into a very approachable um, level for us. And so I think that's really important. And I appreciate that. I really, really do. Well, thank you so much. We try to take care with the organizations because we, our hearts with them as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's been really great. Well, Shannon Pohl, again, director, your part time controller. Shannon brought this up, but it's really true. Um, on the YPTC.com website, you can find a tremendous amount of content, of information, resources, blogs. You will find uh, episodes of the nonprofit show, uh, you know, going all the way back from when we first started. So you can get a lot, you can get up to speed um, in a tremendous way about this very specific aspect of nonprofit accounting, because it is different than general accounting. So check out YPTC.com. You know, we are here also because we have amazing support and that comes from our presenting sponsors. And that includes Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Staffing Boutique, Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraisers Friday, and your part-time controller who's joined us this week for Nonprofit Power Week. Okay, Shannon, I have a... Um, I have a meeting with my bookkeeper tomorrow and um, I'm going to rephrase my mindset on how I ask questions. And um, I'm going to use some of your tools that you brought forward. Amazing. Happy to help. <laughs> All right, everybody. Hey, we sign off each and every episode with the nonprofit show with this message. And it goes like this to stay well so you can do well. Thanks, everyone.